So um, today my talk is going to be a little bit different than the first ones that you saw because what I want to do is give you more of a, um, a variety of case studies that illustrate different types of analyses and data that I've worked with or people in my lab have worked with and the types of models that we've implemented. Most of them are focused on plant and ecosystem ecology, but hopefully if you're in a different field, you'll recognize some similarities in some of the analyses that we've done that will be related to the work that you want to do also. So this is the suggested topics that Lou gave to us, all the presenters, and so I'm going to kind of follow his guidelines, his outline. First, tell you a little bit about myself, how to become as successful as I am. That, again, is Lou's wording. Um, how I've combined quantitative methods with my research, um, examples, so I'm going to give you some case studies specifically involving Bayesian analysis, advice on enhancing your own statistical experience, and then a slide at the end just talking about some interesting sort of areas or applications where uh, we might require the types of quantitative methods that I'll discuss today. So a little bit about my background. Um, started out many years ago, it seems like now, but I did a bachelor's in both math and biology, so that's where I started thinking about integrating ecology and math and statistics. I was a dual major, and I conducted an independent research project as an undergraduate focusing on trying to understand drought-induced uh, tree mortality following a major drought event in the southwest. Um, from there, I went on to do a PhD in biology, and I kept taking or courses in math and statistics, and during that time, I was introduced to Bayesian methods at Duke, and I decided to also pursue a master's in statistics where I could learn a lot more about Bayesian methods. And during my PhD, my, in terms of my research interest, I started focusing more on trying to understand mechanisms or processes associated with how plants respond to the environment, such as drought. So I worked a lot with plant physiological ecology. I used stable isotope applications. And again, this is, like I say, this is where I started to develop my Bayesian skills. Prior to that, I knew a lot about math and sort of classical statistics and mathematical statistics. And this is where I started to work in Bayesian. Then from there, I went on to do a postdoc at Princeton by a, um, an NSF bioinformatics postdoc, which allowed me to explore more ecological problems. So I started working in forest, um, synthesizing existing data sets and developing process models of how trees grow and die. And during this time, I started also developing large databases of plant functional traits. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some analyses involving that. And I really expanded more upon my Bayesian modeling skills um, via just my own experiences and collaborations and starting to lead seminars with other people, reading articles and papers and working on a variety of collaborative projects. Then I started as a faculty member and a joint appointment in both botany and statistics at University of Wyoming. And I recruited people to my lab, postdocs and so forth that brought in new expertise and experiences, which allowed me to start also going into the field of ecosystem ecology. So my first postdoc I brought to my lab was um, an expert in soil carbon dynamics. She brought lots of data with her that she didn't analyze for a PhD. She didn't know how to analyze it. So we did a lot of modeling and analysis with her existing data sets. Um, and continue some of the forest work also. And currently now I'm a faculty member, uh, associate professor at Arizona State University in the School of Life Sciences. And in terms of type of research I address, I st basically I'm expanding on what I call the forest projects, desert projects, large scale processes involving applications of species specific individual based models at regional scales, computational methods for doing that. Um, and I'm gonna talk about some of this other stuff today too. So in general, how do my sort of efforts devoted to various ecological scales and process evolved over time throughout my career? I started out at sort of individual plant scale, went to more ecosystem scale, and now I'm back to ecosystem and individual plants. I've worked and focused a lot on water relations and carbon relations in these systems, delved a little bit in terms of that implications of community or population dynamics, but that's a very minor element of my research program. And then in terms of the relative effort devoted to statistical approaches, like I said, I started out with training in sort of frequentist-based methods through my undergraduate and then applying those methods to some of my earlier work, learning some about likelihood methods that I used. But as soon as I started taking my first Bayesian class, basically I became converted. So, <laughs> but I have a background in all of these, so I'm not just like, you know, Bayesian, only Bayesian. I actually knew about classical methods before that. So, um, you know, in terms of success, when, and Lou said, well, tell them a little bit why you're successful. So I thought, well, you know, I kind of, I call myself, you know, um, I use Bayesian methods, and I'm kind of known for doing that in ecology, so I want to go out there and say, okay, who all is using Bayesian methods in ecology? 
So I went to Web of Science, and I just typed in topic Bayesian, and then I limited it to research areas that are categorized as environmental science, ecology. So if you do that, that reduces the number of articles you find, about 3,800. And if you just filter it by people who have published more four articles, you have almost 300 p different people, researchers, have published using Bayesian in this field. And so uh, this, just to show you, okay, I'm fairly successful in this field. I'm in the top, you know, whatever, uh, close to 10. I'm tied for 11th place or whatever. Um, and I'm also bolding. There's actually quite a few people that have come from Duke, including Brian and Yannicka that are here. And this is, you know, Duke is one of the powerhouses in terms of Bayesian methods. Um, I've highlighted a couple other people here that I thought was kind of cool. I didn't know this was going to happen, but Zach. Gompert was a PhD student at Wyoming when I was there. He took my Bayesian class, right? So this is because he took my class and he worked <laughs> with his advisor. Now they're in the top 30, so I'm very impressed by that. <laughs> Mevin Hooten is a colleague of mine. We co-teach a two-week-long summer course on Bayesian methods for ecologists at Colorado State. This is focused on faculty and postdocs and agency scientists. So you should encourage your faculty members to attend. The goal is that they go there. They learn these methods and they bring them back and disseminate the information through reading, you know, reading groups or seminars with their lab groups. So it's supposed to be this domino effect. So if you want to learn more about this, encourage you know, postdocs or faculty in your lab groups or at your institution to try to apply for this workshop. It's in high demand. We receive over 100 applications and accept about 25 a year. Um, and then this is also a close colleague of mine, Inez, who is another dookie. We have co-taught the day-long workshop on Bayesian methods that we have offered at ESA. Um, we're not doing it this year, but we'll probably do it again in the future. Okay, so again, why am I successful at what I do? This should give part of it away, right, this network diagram. A lot of it is through collaborations, through great people I have in my lab, students and postdocs have done a lot of the work, right, and I help them learn the methods. And collaborators, a lot of them bring data. I actually, or my lab or myself, actually probably only collect about 10% of the data that we work with. The other data sets are coming from outside. Um, so that's really important. Those collaborations are key um, to, I think, my success. And also what's important in terms of the success with respect to the type of research I do is an integrative approach. I have you know, training in math, statistics, biology, ecology. So in term, and I try to encourage this in my own students in my lab. And I also would encourage this with you guys, too, to try to get this kind of diverse training to build a skill set that is fairly unique. So in the work that we do, we, you know, so my students collect their own data. Um, they process a lot of that in the lab. We might draw upon existing data sets, you know, public repositories or data from other collaborators. We bring those data sets together by statistical methods. Um, those statistical approaches usually analyze the data in context of some sort of theoretical model that you can describe by mathematical equation. When you combine those types of approaches with the data, it usually becomes kind of complicated. So we use various computing and simulation techniques to do that integration. Okay, so what I want to tell you first is just starting out from my background from where I began with. So um, one of the first papers I wrote as a PhD student before I took any Bayesian classes, this, this is that first paper. Um, it was looking at stomatal conductance and photosynthesis in this desert shrub in Laria. I wanted to understand what the factors that controlled it, how it varied over time. And so the general idea here was as I collected a bunch of Manual, so I actually did do a lot of field work as a PhD student, making manual measurements 10 hours a day for you know, every other day or every day of the week during the summertime. This represents uh, measurements of photosynthesis, conductance, and what we call leaf internal CO2 concentration. These are averages across shrubs. So we have multiple observations within a day. Each point is an average of at least eight, probably about eight shrubs. And so the idea is try to understand this variability, whether a factor is driving this in the system for the shrub. So the type of approach that I took um, was sort of what, what I call now a piecewise approach. I was only somewhat satisfied with it while I was working with it because I, you know, I wanted to be able to think about integrating all these data sets at once. We know physiologically that photosynthesis depends upon conductance, how open the stomata are, because the stomata are going to let CO2 into their leaf. The, the photosynthetic rate depends upon the difference between the CO2 concentration inside the leaf and the atmosphere. So photosynthesis biologically or physiologically depends upon these two quantities. And conductance was also modeled as depending upon some maximum conductance that could happen during the day that could be controlled by other factors. 
So I went through this piecewise analysis where I fit a nonlinear least square as a model to understand maximum conductance each day. From there, I took that and I put that into the mo my model for day within day conductance over time using a nonlinear mixed effects model that used maximum likelihood to get parameter estimates. Then I took the results from that analysis and I plugged it into a model for CI and photosynthesis. So this is piecewise step process. And you know, in the end, I thought, it sure seems like it would be better to do this all at once, but I don't see a clearer approach to do that using the tools that I know. So then I took my first Bayesian class that, that now is aligned when you think about this differently. So how many people have had some training in Bayesian, even if it's just like a day of a workshop? Okay, so almost half of you, so that's good. And those that didn't raise your hand, have you heard the word Bayesian before at least? Okay. <laughs> all right, so the basic idea behind Bayesian is that and why I find it so appealing is that it's based upon simple probability rules that, that are not contested, right? These are real, these are basically kind of like mass balance type of rules. So it's a probability foundation that provides a mechanism for integrating data, of potentially different types of data, um, with process models like these mathematical models or theoretical models and the unknown parameters that tell you about those models and the data. And it's based upon Bayes' rule which is just a simple formula I'll show you in a second. And it also makes you think about joint distributions, conditional distributions, and marginal distributions of probabilities. Those all come into play, and those are usually quantities in the end that we're trying to estimate. So th those are the primary players. So this is an example of um, Bayes' rule applied to a, da a simple Bayesian data analysis. So the goal here, and I'm using this bracket notation because it's very shorthand notation that is being used more frequently. This, is, this means the probability or the probability distribution of x, which some people write of p of x or f of x, so just simple notation. So this represents a probability or probability distribution for your unknown parameters. I think I have a slide here. For unknown parameters, these would be like regression coefficients, co uh, variance terms, uh, treatment effects, things that you want to estimate. Conditional on your data, so just conditional on what you've actually observed your data. It's not conditional on things that you could have observed but you didn't, right? That's the classical sort of frequentist um, interpretation. This is then written according to Bayes' rule. That's what's on the right-hand side here. This would be the joint distribution of the data and your unknown quantities, your parameters theta, divided by this bottom term is actually the marginal distribution of your data. Okay, so how you get that is you take the conditional distribution of your data given parameters. So what would you expect the distribution of your data to look like if your parameter took on a particular value? Multiplied by the distribution of your parameters. So what are the possible range of values your parameters can take on? And integrate over all possible values of your parameters. So you integrate out all the uncertainty about your parameters and you're left wha over with what's called a joint distribution for data. Um, I note here that this bottom, this denominator, is just what we call normalizing constant. Once you've observed your data, it's just a bunch of numbers in a table someplace. And so that denominator is also just a number. Okay, so you can think of basically ignoring that denominator, because it's just, just a number, and your numerator is a thing that contains the unknowns. The thetas are the unknowns. So we can write this formula very simply. This is our simple Bayesian formula. The conditional distribution of the unknowns, theta, given your data is proportional to the conditional distribution of data given parameters theta times this marginal probability of the th uh, parameters. So we can give terms to each of these. Our goal in this, all these analyses is to obtain the posterior distribution. That's what this is called for your unknowns, given what you know, which are the data. That's proportional to the likelihood of your data. So probably everybody's heard about likelihood. You have to think about that when you talk about your sampling distribution, that will give rise to some appropriate likelihood. And then this last part here is what makes this really um, unique to a Bayesian analysis is you have a prior distribution on your parameters. That prior can either be what we call non-informative. You say, I don't know anything about my parameters before observing my data. I'm going to make it like diffuse or flat. Essentially, any value of theta is likely before I observe my data. Or you can make it informative because you have expert opinion or knowledge or you have information from previous studies or the literature, so you have some idea of what those parameters might be, or you have biological or physical constraints that say some of these parameters are constrained between some maximum and minimum value, or they have to be ordered some way relative to another, right? So you can build in those kind of ideas into that prior, which makes this 
really appealing, and the Bayesian approach is, uh, is one of the few approaches that allows you to do this explicitly. Okay, so that's a very simple approach, but when you have more complicated types of data that you guys are all talking about here at the workshop, we have to extend that approach to deal with the types of issues that you're encountering. So here will be an example of one extension where we can think of um, modifying this to include what we call hierarchical parameter model. So in this case, we might actually think of two different types of parameters, theta and phi, two different unknowns. And we might think of the data as being conditional on some parameter phi. And then that parameter phi, its distribution or the values it takes on could depend upon another parameter, a population level parameter, what we call theta. And then we assign a prior to theta, that population level parameter. This would be a hierarchical model for the parameters here. Um, we can express these types of models, and I think this is very useful for when you start out. Express it as a graph, and that helps you put together the pieces. So in this particular example, we have um, a n the graph here would be called a DAG. We have nodes representing different types of quantities in the model. Here's our node that represents data. Here's a node that represents the parameters that give rise to the data. And here's a node that represents the parameters that tell you about the variability in the theta parameters, right? So there's three levels in this model, this hierarchical model. Um, there's a first level, which is the likelihood. There's level two, which describes the parameters, first level parameters. We call it the prior. There's level three, which describes hyperparameters, and we give it a hyperprior. You go level four, you have hyper hyperparameters, hyper hyperpriors. At some point, we stop saying hyper, 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 and we just call this level one, two, three, or four. Right? It just be, builds up a hierarchical model. And then the nodes, you can give different names. This is, data is a terminal node because the information flow stops there. Right? There's no arrow coming out of data. This theta, or sorry, phi is a root node because the information starts here and then it go, follows the arrows. Information about theta tells you about, or sorry, information about phi tells you about theta, which tells you about data. Right? So you can draw a graphical model like this to tell you how to put together your probability model up here. Data depends upon theta, data depends upon theta. Theta depends upon phi, theta depends upon phi. Phi is by itself, it's a root node, it's not conditional on anything, it's a root node down here. Okay, so those match up. Yeah, so I mean, an example here would be, um, yeah, here are a bunch of site effects, and they vary around some distribution that, as there's a variance that describes the variability among sites. Side effects and the, the variance term. That would be an example. Okay, so that's that for me. Another thing that you might do is to extend this to include what we call a stochastic process model, where you think of, now I've taken this part up here and I've added a third unknown that we call process. Um, so we have theta, phi, and process given our data. That's this posterior for the three unknowns, proportional to a likelihood. So here the idea is that the data you almost always measure data with some error. So think about the data as being equal to the true value that you want to observe but you can't. So what you observe is the truth plus observation error. In this latent or unknown process, you might actually be wanting to describe or understand, right? But you can't observe it directly. That latent process then, you can think of writing as, writing as um, a, a, this should be, this is true process. Sorry, I got this mixed up. Some process here, mean, this is a mean process, plus some process error. So the point here is that this is the truth that you can't observe directly. Scratch out truth. This is the uh, a mean or expected process that you could describe by some sort of model, like a differential equation model or simulation model or regression model, but approximates the system, approximates the truth. And then you have some error because no model is perfect, right? There's some sort of process or model error. Um, another way that you might want to extend this is if you have multiple data types, right? That you want to simultaneously integrate. You want to analyze at the same time. So here the idea is that the posterior for your unknowns is conditional on the data, but the data themselves actually contain n different data sources. They can vary in spatial, temporal resolution, effort, cost, whatever. But they're all related to your underlying process or your system of interest. So what you would do up here is take your likelihood and you would have to write out a joint likelihood for all the data simultaneously given the process and the parameters. In practice, that is, you can't think about joint likelihoods very well. If you have count data that are measured once a month and then you have continuous um, environmental data measured 30 minutes, how do you think about how, you know, a joint process model? 
or joint, joint likelihood. But instead what you can do is usually write out this likelihood as a product of um, conditional or marginal likelihood. So maybe the outcome from data set one depends upon the other data sets and some unknowns. The observations for data set two might depend upon data set three and so forth and some unknowns. All the way down to the last data set that might just depend upon some process. You have to figure out how do you order the data sets so that it makes sense. So now you're modeling these conditional data sets. One data set at a time, it's very easy to think about how does you know, photosynthesis, depend photosynthesis data depend upon temperature data, right? You can probably think about that pretty easily. Um, you can draw a DAG for this kind of example. Um, so here I'm il illustrating an example as three different data sets that may be related to two different processes. So an, an example based upon my own work where we might have a system where we're measuring soil respiration or CO2 fluxes. We do this manually, let's say, at a bunch of different sites. And then we also collect soil respiration continuously, every 30 minutes, but only at a few sites. They both tell us about the same type of process, but they're measured differently. So they would say, share the same latent process, the same true respiration. And then maybe respiration depends upon some other completely different type of data, like microbial biomass or litter or soil carbon, right, that tells you about this substrate for respiration. Completely different type of data that might depend upon the true microbial dynamics or something in the system. And these different processes might share similar parameters, like some sort of index of microbial community diversity or something. Right, so you can, there's all these nodes here and these down here represent just observation uncertainties, variance terms, observation error, observer error, sampling error, instrument bias, you know, something related to how the data is collected. Using that DAG, then you can write out your posterior is proportional to the product. Here's the, the likelihood parts. We have, um, should just have three different parts here for three different data sets. And then we have process models here, so forth. So for this particular one, you can break it down data one, given process one, uh, data two, given process one, data th three. No, wait, where's my data three? I did this late at night. I missed it. It's up here. It's right there. Okay. Right. So there's our data. Here's our process one model, process two model. Then we have a hierarchical prior here, hierarchical prior, root node for this prior. Here's a root node. Here's a root nodes. Right. So you can put all the pieces together. Um, so if I came back to this example for my PhD, I could have done this as a simultaneous analysis if I would have implemented this in the Bayesian framework. I would just have to write out my posterior for all the parameters related to these different quantities um, given the, those observations. I would break it out into a photosynthesis likelihood, a CI likelihood, a conductance likelihood, a maximum G at, um, conductance likelihood, and then their hierarchical priors that tell us about those different processes, and then some root node parameters that might be population level parameters or variance terms. So I could have done this, but at that time I didn't know about it, so I I did it piecewise. Why would we want to do this kind of thing simultaneously or use a Bayesian approach? So this is one of the sort of standard slides I give about why Bayesian. But you can't, using the framework, you can analyze multiple data sets at the same time. And that really only makes sense if the data sets at some point share some kind of parameters, if they share a variance term or they're linked to um, the same process at some point. If there's no sharing of anything amongst the data sets, it doesn't make, you don't have to do them together. You're, that's not going to have any advantage. But if they share anything at any point in that graph, then you want to do them together. Um, you can propagate then uncertainty among the model components more appropriately. Um, oh, another thing about Bayesian, you're not really restricted to, restricted to assumptions or normality. Pick whatever distribution is appropriate. You can combine normal, gamma, Wishart, beta, log normal, whatever distributions are appropriate, they can be combined into all one analysis. Each one of these bracket terms could be uh, described by a different type of distribution that's appropriate for that particular quantity. Okay, so I was going to give you some examples here, um, and we probably aren't going to have time to go through all of them. So once we start getting close to time, I'll probably just skip one and end on the last slide. But if you have interest in one I skipped, you can talk to me about it. I do want to do the first two and maybe one of these two. These last two are somewhat related. So this first one, um, how many in here at some point are interested or want to do some kind of meta-analysis involving you know, literature search and you want to analyze the data? So there's probably, it looks like about a third of you. 
Okay, so this, is, this will give you an idea of an alternative approach to doing a meta-analysis. So this is a case study, Bayesian meta-analysis of tree functional traits. I'm going to focus on specific leaf area. It's a trait that's very easy to measure. There's lots of data in the literature. All that is is you go out to a leaf and you measure the surface area of the leaf and you divide by the dry weight. That tells you something about the structure of that leaf. It's related to photosynthesis. It's related to um, herbivore preferences, nitrogen content, a variety of other things that are, are it's important for understanding. But we're just going to look at SLA. Um, as part of this, um, my lab has been compiling a huge literature database on tree functional traits, including SLA, but a bunch of other traits related to the physiology, anatomy, and structure of trees. This is all extracted from the literature, so we extract things like sample means, sample variances, sample sizes, and all sorts of metadata to go along with every quantity that we extract. So metadata are things like where th does that quantity associate with a particular treatment that was applied, elevated CO2 or watering or so forth. What are various sample or study site information we need to keep track of that could affect that observation that was reported? Um, site information, what species does it belong to? Who published the value, right? Keep track of the source information. So there's this huge database now that we're going to query. And here's an example of a, a summary of the query for two different traits, specifically leaf area and wood density. Let's just focus on the specific leaf area column. So how many records do we have? Almost 1,900 derived from about 180 different studies or papers. That represents about half of the species in the U.S. that we're interested in. And it represents two-thirds of the genera in the U.S. Um, but when you do this kind of, you think about whatever trait or quantity you're extracting from the literature, it's probably going to be affected by other things, right? There's, an, it's an, there's some uncertainty associated with it that you can quantify based upon standard errors and sample size. So how certain are you about that sample mean? And then that particular value could be affected by covariates or methods. And for SLA, these are the type of covariates that would affect the value that we extract. One important thing here, for example, sightedness is a method-related variable. People may s rep tell you or measure just one side leaf area, one side leaf area divided by weight, or they measure the top and the bottom, two side leaf area and divide by weight. The difference between those two numbers is a factor of two, right? If you do one side or two sided. But so only 51% of the studies, half of them tell you whether they did one side or two sided. The rest of them don't tell you. This is a... Um, the percent missing for these other quantities. So about half the studies report sample sizes or standard errors, right? So if you're doing a classical meta-analysis, you would throw away all the studies that were missing information, which would leave me with only 21% of my records. In this case, it leaves me with only 6%. That's, that is not very satisfying. I want to keep all my information. I don't want to throw it away. So the approach that we take is to do a Bayesian meta-analysis um, with what we call feedback control that allows us to impute missing values or observations, missing covariate data, missing sample size, and standard error type information. And the feedback part says all we're going to do is use the observed values of these covariates to inform the missing values. We're not going to let any other data or components of the model tell us about the missing values. Only that covariate that's been observed is going to help us impute the missing ones. So this is a DAG. It's just a more complicated than we see. It's a hierarchical DAG. Here's our data, our sample mean. Right, so if we build up this model, we start out with the sample mean, very simple. It's a mean by central limit theorem. You can probably assume it's approximately normal. And that itself has some overall mean and some variance that depends upon the sample size. Then for the mean model right here, so what's the, the you know, how do you describe average specific leaf area? This is just a fairly simple regression type model. Has some sort of study by species random effect out front. Then it's corrected by, oh, I switched those around. This is wood density. These are switched. This is specific leaf area. Some study by species random effect. Then there's a fixed effects of tree age and light environment. Then there's an uh, effect of whether it was sampled for leaves or canopy. So that effect. And this is a conversion factor, sidedness. It's either a one or a two. Okay, it's, just a, it's a methods related term. And then for these record level covariates over here um, and the study level covariates, Study level cover, it's right here. We have this missing data model that we're going to impute the missing values. Okay. Then th we have this hierarchical model here that says the species by site random effects vary around a species mean. So some overall species mean, that's actually what we want. That's like the species-specific trait that we want to report. 
That's one of our goals. It varies around the species mean with this variance that tells us about variability within a species among sites. Then we go to the next level, right? We can build up levels, so species means vary around a genus level mean. This builds in a taxonomy for the hierarchy. Genus mean varies around an order mean. Order varies by division. There's only two divisions. These are root nodes. We're going to assign them what we call diffuse priors and let the data tell us what um, conifers versus angiosperms average SLA is. So that's a hierarchical prior that uses a taxonomy. This taxonomy or hierarchical prior is really important because it allows us to estimate traits for all 300 species, even though we've only observed them for 150. So those species that are missing are going to learn from species that they're closely related to, so within a genus. Right? So you can estimate then species for all 300. Or if you want to be a little bit more accurate about relationships among species, you can replace the taxonomy with a phylogeny. So here's a phylogeny of the 85 genera. Zoom in on a particular genus here, Magnolia. You could, then we have the species level phylogenies for that particular genus. So this creates another DAG. It tells you this species, its parameter varies around its parent node parameter. That parameter varies around this one, right? So the ancestor parameters vary around their ancestors and so forth. So you can estimate the trait at every level in the phylogeny. So we apply this type of data or this analysis to wood density and SLA, get really good fits. We haven't thrown away any data. We've, been, we've um, estimated the missing values for the covariates. Then you can get estimates of various covert effects. So for example, this tells you about the effect of light environment, whether the plant was in a shady environment, intermediate, or sunny environment. And it tells you about the effects of age, age class of the tree. So this line right here demonstrates that we see a clear effect of light. SLA decreases as light gets brighter, more light, which is generally what we know as physiological ecologists. And then the age effects as the SLA is smaller or sort of lower for mature trees. They generally have thicker, tougher leaves, which is also, you know, this agrees with what we know as physiological ecologists. Um, and then what we've produced here is the estimates for all 305 species. Um, this shows you about half of them for which are in the database. We actually have data for these species. This is their estimate within a particular genus, right? This is the uncertainty about the estimate. And then here are the estimates for species that we do not have the database. And you can notice that their mean is essentially right around the genus mean. And in most cases, this type of analysis would lead w uh, result in wider intervals because we don't have any data about them. Usually those intervals are wider. And they're, and they're approximated by their genus value. So now we can go do whatever you want with this kind of analysis. We have these traits for all species, then what do you want to do? We have all sorts of plans to go from there, but I wanted to give you an idea of a meta-analysis. Any quick questions before I do case study two? Yeah, so I always get this question, and there's no, like, uh, specific cutoff, right? I mean, oh, she, she asked if there's any limitations, basically, on the amount of data that you have available and whether you can estimate, you know, for example, species that you don't have any data. Um, and my answer is that there is no, like, specific answer. And one way you can do that is to test that by creating data sets of varying uh, missingness and see at what point do you, can you not recover like the true parameters that you use to generate the data. We did some simulations like that, but not to address your particular question. But I don't have a specific answer that says, you know, there's a cutoff of 20%, because I think it depends upon the problem. Yeah, yeah. So that could help you identify that cutoff. Yeah. Any other ones? Oh, so here we don't, yeah, so in this case, this is actually, we weren't really quantifying effect sizes. We could have, because you could compare differences um, and compare among species or if I had a treatment effect. Yeah. This is more of an estimation perspective. But you could do a, a meta-analysis trying to estimate effect sizes, and you could employ it in a Bayesian framework that would allow you to keep all your records and not throw away ones that are missing, like standard error. I mean, you go and you survey 200 papers, and in the end, you only collect data from 20 because the rest of them didn't report one quantity. Any other ones? 
Okay, next uh, case study. This one is quite different than that one. Um, here I want to tell you a little bit about how work that we've been doing to quantify time scales of antecedent variables, how they might influence whatever process of interest based using time series type data. This is completely different than a classical time series analysis, but we're planning on comparing our approach to more classical approaches. The particular example I'm going to give you is looking at tree growth based upon tree ringlets and how tree growth is related to past climate data, past climate conditions, precipitation and temperature. So we have two different time series data here that we want to look at. So the ring width data, so this would be an example of a, a cookie or a cross section of a tree, and the data are the widths of these annual rings that tell you about growth from one year to the next, right? So that we have these data that we've extracted from an existing online data bank. Um, and we've done that for several species in the, in the U.S. Here's a DAG that's going to illustrate our analysis here. So here we have ring width, right? That's our data. It's going to tell us how to put together our likelihood. The observed ring width is going to be conditional on a mean or expected ring width that you are going to model some way, like a regression model. So we'll go and put that up. So here's our likelihood. So here we've log transformed our ring width for a particular year or time for a particular tree or core. That's normal with some mean that varies by time and core. And then there's some variance that tells you about basically the residual error term there. Then we go to the next level and say, how do we define this mean? We're just going to do what looks to be deceptively like a fairly simple linear regression model where we have something like this. The mean has these coefficients. These are um, like random coefficients. They're individual level coefficients. So you can think of a random effects model. Each of these coefficients, the intercept and the slope coefficients for our covariates depends upon what tree or core you're looking at. So this would be an effective age, effective antecedent precipitation, antecedent temperature, their interaction. And then there's also expected to be a correlation between this year's ring width and how much the tree grew last year. So this is like an autocorrelation term, kind of like an AR1 type process. So this right here looks like just a linear regression, and on the surface it is. But what makes this more challenging is that these antecedent variables are not known, right? They're not fixed covariates. Instead, they're going to be modeled. We have a stochastic model for them. So I'll, we'll talk about what that is. So looking at our DAG, we have the mean, and it depends upon the antecedent covariates. Then we have separate models for antecedent precipitation, antecedent temperature. So generally when people incorporate antecedent conditions, like antecedent soil moisture, you might take the average soil moisture over the past week, and you use it as a fixed covariate that goes into your analysis. So what we want to say is that we don't know how long, how, what's the time period over which we should average. And maybe different times in the past have different importance weights, right? Not everything's equally important as would be suggested by a mean. So here's a very simple model for computing an antecedent variable. This could be precipitation or temperature. We're going to take the observed values for some year, so 1900, 1901, 1902, and then each year has um, monthly records of temperature, average temperature, total precip. And we're going to compute the antecedent value as some weighted average of the past observations over some past time period. So we're going to average over years going from the current year to maybe four or five, six years ago. And we're going to average over each month within a year. So these weights here look like probabilities, essentially. This is the importance of precipitation received in month M um, given a particular year it's in. This year, last year, the previous year, so forth. And this is a relative importance of precipitation received during different, t different years. The importance of this year, the importance of last year, the importance of the year before that. These are the importance weights that we don't know. We're going to estimate these. We're not just going to do a simple average. We're going to estimate them. So these unknown importance weights, these WXs, the monthly ones, and the W primes, which are the annual weights, tell us about the relative importance of climate conditions occurring again at past years and at different months. If you then get, we're going to get estimates for these Ws, we can plot them over time, and that will help reveal very, the uh, w potential lags in responses to climate and the time scales of influence. You know, how far back in time do these variables affect growth? The implementation of this is actually kind of tricky because, like I said, um, if you go back to the previous slide, What's happening here is you're multiplying an unknown quantity, a parameter, by another unknown. You have the product of two unknowns. So in order to estimate that, um, that can create what we call identifiability issues if you try to separate the product of two unknown things. We have to implement some fairly simple coding and reparameterization tricks that allow this model to actually 
Mixwell in terms of the um, MCMC implementation and converge and we get good estimates in the end. That makes it run faster. This would be an example then of what we get in terms of the annual weights, the relative importance of precipitation and temperature received or occurring during different years, so during the year of growth, the previous year, two years ago, right? And we have that for different species and different sites. So one thing you can see here is that temporal patterns, up and down, how these weights are, they differ between the climate variable and they differ between the si sites and species. So as an example, let's just look at the precipitation one. One thing that is fairly consistent is that precipitation received during the year of growth or last year have the highest weights, meaning that it's most important. So precipitation during current year and previous year is most important for predicting tree growth. But that is in contrast to temperature. Look at the importance weight for current temperature. Generally, it has a weight of almost zero. So temperature conditions during the year of growth are not important in most of these cases. There's longer lags associated with the temperature effect. You can zoom in on this and get a finer time scale understanding of these important weights at the monthly time scale going from, this would be December of the year of growth. Basically, the trees aren't growing in December. So you would, I don't know why that has a high weight, actually, now that I think about it. I'm not sure why that's high. Uh, they're not growing then. These all make sense because they're not growing during the fall. So we have low weights. Um, you go further back in time here, and you can see some peaks. All of these right here have really high weights. This says that pre a precipitation received during the winter and spring prior to growth is most important for growth. And then you can identify a couple other peaks that are related to even longer lags that help you identify seasons further back in time that could be critical for growth. Um, you can look at the coefficients associated with those effects. This would be the effect of age, antecedent precipitation, antecedent temperature, and previous year ring width. So there's just a couple things I want to point out. I call these two things endogenous effects. They tell you about how properties of the tree affect growth. And if you look at the effects across all the different cores or individuals, they differ among cores. So for these endogenous effects, we see that there's variation among individuals that might affect, reflect something like ontogenetic growth patterns. But if you look at the exogenous climate effects, they're all significantly different than zero, but they don't differ among individuals. So it appears that these climate effects reveal population level acclimation or adjustment to site level conditions that's consistent across all individuals. And given that we are out of time, I will let you ask me questions about this one. I'll tell you that this one was a large-scale synthesis of long-term data from six years involving manually collected time series data, integration of a bunch of different covariates and so forth. You can see the models more complicated, involving an antecedent model I just t told you about related to soil respiration. The other one um, was interesting because it actually incorporates um, a process model based upon diffusion theory, PDE equations that are then solved at some point to give you an analytical expression for the expected process model, right? Inspired by theory and physics. That is then fit to data on uh, trace gas concentrations collected over time to reveal trace gas fluxes at the soil surface. So this is a little bit different than the others because we're actually using this sort of uh, theory-based process model. So if you have questions about that, you can um, ask me. But Luke, this is something that I wanted to talk about that's not, we'll have some, maybe a little bit of discussion. Here. I don't know if we're going to get to this later, but enhancing your statistical experience, right? How do you go about doing this? Um, my perspective is from a modeling, an inference, and estimation perspective. That's basically what all my case studies were about. So what kind of courses would you want to take to develop the skills that you would need? So this is what I usually recommend students in my lab. Jessica has already worked through about half of these or more. Um, everybody should have some understanding of calculus. Calc 2, minimal, hopefully Calc 3. I have graduate students coming to my lab that actually take remedial calculus courses to get up to that speed. Mathematical statistics, where you learn about probability, probability theory, expected values, distributions. I think that's more important than taking a bunch of sort of specialized applied courses, ANOVA, regression, so forth. You le learn the fundamentals, then maybe take a modeling type class like regression. Um, from there, I would suggest doing something fairly modern like maximum likelihood or Bayesian approaches that will be much more flexible than just drop-down menus um, that you might see in something like Jump or whatever. Um, learn programming. R. I'm just learning R myself right now, I have to admit. I hope that the rest of you are already on your way. This is the time to do it. Don't wait until you're a faculty member. 
Um, and then maybe you'll take a couple specialized classes specifically related to your type of data or the things that you plan on doing. I also would suggest if you are at an institution that has some sort of graduate certificate and you have enough background to do this, I would pursue a graduate certificate in statistics or applied math or computing. I mean, this will only help you in terms of building your skill set and having tools to address your problems. Develop collaborations. Learn to speak statistics so that you can collaborate with a statistician that can help you with your analysis and models. And go to them before you start collecting data if you can. Um, interact with your fellow students. Learn about problems. Provide input just like we're doing here. You can learn a lot from talking with each other and you're probably not as kind of reluctant to speak up when you're talking with your peers. Uh, Self-learning I think is really important. Organize reading groups. Um, organize problems where you guys come in and work on problems. Hands-on stuff. Could program together. Can do something like that. Ask one of your faculty advisors to offer a, a seminar course for focused learning, right? Just a one credit hour seminar course. It's not that much work for us to do. I just need a uh, critical mass. And explore potentially short courses, Nimbus uh, tutorials. They're anywhere from a day or three or four long. Uh, ESA workshops, like the day-long workshop that I've organized or co-organized. Summer courses. There's a variety of ones out there um, that you could you know, apply for and hopefully get, hopefully get into that might offer training beyond what you can get at your own institution. And this um, I, is not terribly important. I'll just leave that up there. My last slide. Because I don't have interesting ecological questions. I'm just the types of problems that you might encounter and methods, quantitative methods that you need.